experiment because the radar antenna was so big, it took the whole bay of the shuttle, you know, to, 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 to fit it in. So, and, and then it was scheduled to launch first in 1980, then it ended being in 19, you know, 81. So that was my first opening of being the, the top dog, if you want, <laughs> you know, on an experiment in my late in my late 20s and, and, you know, being a Caltech graduate who are never intimidated by anything, you know, on the way back. Uh, and, and, uh, and one of my, you know, throughout my career, even when I was young at that time at Caltech and after one, my favorite thing was my hobby was to read, uh, you know, biographies of American presidents. And my favorite one was Teddy Roosevelt. Sure. And I remember a quote from Teddy Roosevelt, which said something like, uh, far better to dare mighty things than even though checkered with failures, than to sit down in the twilight of neither victory nor defeat. So I start telling my team, hey, we're daring mighty things here. And plus anyway, it's high risk. NASA will not pay attention to us. If it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but we need to do our best, you know, to make it work. So that led during that period where we had to do a lot of flying to the Johnson Space Center because we had to deal with the astronaut and the shuttle, a lot to the Cape, you know, for uh, for interacting with the shuttle. And then it led that mission to fly in 1981. So going back to your question, and then I can expand on the shuttle. So NASA's philosophy at that time for the radar is, gee, we're going to do this shuttle mission, so let's see what we can do with it before we move to, toward a pre-flyer. And then they focused on doing the altimeter and the scatterometer on dedicated mission, which would be a smaller, a smaller, uh, you know, spacecraft. And that's what led to a series of mission called Topex Poseidon uh, jointly with the French uh, space agency. So, so that was that track, you know, for the other instruments. And the radar, the track was to do the shuttle. So here we come to 1981, getting ready for the for the shuttle flight. Uh, and of course, you know, we were nervous, but we were all excited about it. Uh, and I remember very clearly about a month before the launch, when we had built everything. It was at the Cape. Uh, Bruce Murray used to be was the director at that time. So it was 1981. Uh, Bruce Murray was one of the faculty member in planetary science. At Caltech that I got to know a little bit, you know, from Caltech. He calls me to my to his office. So I said, oh, I wonder why Bruce wants to chat with me. So I walk in his office and he was, Bruce was talking about the history, the most casual director you ever had. He was in his short, in his flip-flops, his feet was on the, on the desk, completely opposite of his predecessor Pickering, who was always in tie and suit, or his successor, which was Lou Allen, who was always in a tie very close. So Bruce said, Charles, we just, I just got called from the administrator of NASA uh, asking me about this Sir A mission for shuttle imaging radar A because it was the first in a series. And he said a lot of people are asking him questions about the benefit of the shuttle. Why are we spending? So you'd better be successful, you know, in this mission. I said, oh shoot, here we go. Nobody, it was supposedly high risk. You know, nobody was paying attention to us. Uh, we took a few shortcuts, you know, on it because it was a high-risk mission. And now NASA shuttle depends on us being successful. So anyway, fortunately, it was successful. <laughs> so we flew, the radar worked perfectly for the whole, uh, the mission was, I think, four or five days. It worked perfect. But the interesting thing is at that time, uh, uh, digital recorder were very much in their infancy. You know, we didn't have the kind of bitrate that we needed for the radar. So we had an optical record. So the radar signal was coming in the instrument. The instrument, uh, you know, kind of modulated a, uh, a laser or, or an optical beam. And then we wrote the signal on an optical film in the optical recorder. So we knew we were receiving echoes, but we didn't know that we actually we were recording the data on it because we didn't have that capability. And there was no link to the ground to transmit the data to the ground, you know, for the instrument, so really mostly for the shuttle. The so we were in the blind until the shuttle landed. And engineers went inside the shuttle, pulled out the film because we needed to pull it out quickly because the landing was in the Mojave. And uh, it was, you know, the temperature.
temperature was not very amenable to optical film. Drove it during the night to JPL. We developed the film. We looked at it, and we could see signal on it. So that was a big relief. Then we had to process it through an optical correlator that I learned about from Nick George, you know, in the class at Caltech, and we saw beautiful images on it. So we developed the film. The program manager from headquarters got on a morning airplane, went to, to headquarters, and showed it to the NASA administrator. So it was a big deal. Yeah. So I was a hero. You know, <laughs> I, I, not planned, but, but it happened that way. And then the next thing, other than we were successful and got beautiful images, and this one, the focus was more on the land, you know, mapping geology, and, uh, and you can see beautiful features, you know, on it. A uh, couple of days later, we were looking at an image which we taken over Egypt, you know, in North Africa, and it looked like there are rivers on it all over the place. Yeah. And so uh, some of my team members were from the geologic survey, you know, in Flagstaff, and they have done a lot of work in Egypt. And they said there are no rivers there. We have never seen anything. So to make a long story short, it turned out that the radar was actually penetrating through the sand and mapping the old river beds, which have been then covered because of the change in the environment, talking about the global change, uh, because of the change in the environment in North Africa, uh, that uh, the belief was it was much more humid four or 5,000 years ago. And then with the change and the sand covered all these river beds, and the radar was penetrating through the sand and imaging the, the remnant of those river beds on it. It immediately clicked, you know, being an electromagnetic wave. Because of course, you know, sand is very dry. It has a very low loss tangent, so we should be able to penetrate through it and see, see what's below the surface. So I did some quick calculation and said, yeah, you should be able to penetrate many, many meters, you know, below the surface. So we quickly wrote an article, you know, scientific article about it. And guess what? It made the front cover of Science <laughs> Magazine, front cover of National Geographic, uh, and, and mostly their interest was not because of radar penetrating. The interest was about the archaeological implications. Yeah, yeah. You know, about it, that if we know what was, you know, these rivers in those days, that could benefit a lot. That's why National Geographic, you know, was interested. <laughs> uh, why that would lead to a lot of things. Charles, okay. you're a you're a you're a you're a principal investigator at this point. The radar is going to be pointed back to Earth, and you're on the cover of magazines. It's a great point to pick up for next time when you're clearly on a trajectory of the things that are going to come.